we are doing it. Hello, every morning. Or hello, every morning. Oh my god. It's gonna be a good day. Good morning, everyone. Today we're streaming on just two devices today. We have one device for Instagram and one device for everything else. Now, I'm told that the chat should work for everything. But um, I'm not counting on it. So there's a chance we're not going to get chat from YouTube and Facebook. But that's okay. All right. I forgot to put in my headphones. Sorry for everyone on Instagram. It'll sound better tomorrow. Let me know if it sounds okay on Instagram, by the way. Um, we have a gigantic microphone here for everyone else, but we have to use exactly our phone for Instagram. So we'll see how it goes. Anyway, good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. I posted a... Um, quote on Instagram yesterday that says something to the effect of things are worth the amount of time you exchange for them. The amount of your life that you exchange for them. And it's very important to make sure that you are spending your life doing beneficial things. If you sit around and do essentially nothing, you're exchanging your life for nothing. And that's not good. It's not good at all, right? So you wanna make sure you're exchanging your life for things that are beneficial. Now, of course, you may not feel obligated to do anything for the world, but I think most people do. Most people want to be useful. Most people want to be beneficial to humanity. So the purpose of all this is basically to say, use your time wisely. Now, listening to me not, may not be using your time the most wisely, but it's probably better than, than some things. What's my son's name? It is James. All right. We had a question. Favorite books? I write down all of my questions I have to talk about on little notepads, on little note cards, so that I don't forget anything. You know what? Turns out we're actually not live on YouTube or Facebook. Hmm. That's lame. Give me a second. If you're here on Twitch and um, if you're here on Twitch and Periscope, I suppose, please let me know. All right, we see we see YouTube is working. It says sending data though. If anyone's here on all the various platforms, please let me know. Is YouTube working? is uh all right good it looks like youtube is working good it says youtube's not working if anyone's here on facebook let me know that too i'm trying out this program called restream.io so we'll see if it works i have this um chat aggregator over here on my computer give me just one second everyone i'm doing my best to figure out how to work all this stuff it's not the easiest thing in the world but hey, that's okay. It looks like the chat is being aggregated, except for, I don't think Facebook's working. Okay, anyway. Is there any difference between, uh, in strategy, says a Grizz Poker, between a 10K, wait, a $100 bounty 10K guaranteed tournament? Well, it depends on how much the bounty is, right? If the bounty is minimal, then the bounty essentially doesn't matter. The way you convert bounty equity, or bounty chips into equity, Let's say you buy in to a $100 buy-in tournament. Half of the money goes to the bounty, half goes to the prize pool. So it's 50 and 50. What you do is you take your stack and place that in one pile, because that's half of your chips, and your bounty in the other half, right? So you have $100 or $50 worth of chips and $50 worth of bounties. That makes logical sense. Your stack is worth $50. So every time that amount of chips goes into the pot, that is worth $50. So, anytime you can collect a bounty is worth $50 then. Let's say it's a $100 tournament with $20 going to the bounty, and they start you with 10,000 chips. What you do now is you take your 10,000 chip starting stack and divide it into four piles, because remember, the bounty is one-fifth of the money. You have four piles of chips, one pile of bounty, right? So, 2,500, 2,500, 2,500, 2,500. So now, the bounty chip is worth 2,500 chips. That's how you figure out what the bounty is worth, um, difference in strategy. Obviously, there should be some difference in strategy. And that's it. 
Let's see. They're saying sound is very low on Twitch. Sound should be fine. Everyone on Twitch, let me know if um, the Twitch sound is not working properly. Chat aggregator doesn't seem to be working properly. I know that. I can see people posting stuff on Twitch, but um, sound is okay on Twitch. Okay, good. Sound seems good. Good, it means people are actually seeing me on Twitch. Apparently people are not seeing me on Facebook, though, so we have to fix Facebook. That's okay. We'll leave Facebook out to dry today. I don't like Facebook that much anyway. Funny, though. A lot of people um, try to sound like all fancy, boycotting Facebook, but you realize Instagram's owned by Facebook, right? And Twitter's not so different. Don't be, don't be silly. Okay, favorite books. Hmm. We discussed this one the other day. This is called The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. I don't read this every day, but I read it most days. It's essentially a devotional with stoicism quotes. You know, I go through and highlight stuff that's beneficial. I'm going to give this to my son one day. And, um, you know, I think it'll be useful. Let's see. The person who is free... Hey, wait. The person is free who lives as they wish. Neither compelled, nor hindered, nor limited whose choices aren't hampered, whose desires succeed, and who do not fall into what repels them. It's very important to not fall into what repels you. A lot of people have problems falling into what repels them. You know, maybe, maybe poker, maybe drinking, maybe drugs, maybe specific people in your life. There's a lot of things that repel people, and you have to make sure that does not happen to you. Let's see. I begin to speak only when I'm certain what I'll say isn't better left unsaid. That's why we have a talk show. <laughs> I do think it's very important to only say things that are beneficial, by the way. I think a lot of people just talk to talk. We discussed this the other day, where essentially you, you need to make a point to add to conversations when you're talking. If you don't actually know something or if you're not adding anything, you probably don't need to be talking. This is why there's so much clutter in the world at the moment. This is why poker forums, the, the big ones at least, are pretty much useless today. Because everyone thinks their opinion is relevant. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's just not, it's not valuable, right? You want to make sure you're adding value. All right, from Twitter. What would I advise someone who stepped, who stopped playing poker for a few years and would like to start playing low limit, no limit holding again? Well, get right into it. Hop in. Uh, I have two little books. Strategies for Beating Small Stakes Poker Cash Games and Strategies for Beating Small Stakes Poker Tournaments. These are very small books. They're only like 80 pages each. Not big, right? And these will give you very actionable tips to help you beat these small stakes games. So that is a good way to go about getting started. People are saying the volume is low for some reason. I'll tell you why the volume is low. I was used to speaking like this. Hello, hello, hello. We're not going to speak like this into the microphone. It's just not practical. All right, let's see. How many hands should you call against an unknown player who three bets you? Well, that is a question for pokercoaching.com. Go there, study, and you will see the answer to that. If you have not already, sign up to my site. It's completely free to sign up. Pokercoaching.com. You can sign up for free for one week. And um, we answer questions like this. How do you proceed when you get three bet? That might, maybe it was like the first or second homework question. This is not uh, rocket science, but it does require a nice little range image and uh, a little bit of range analysis to figure out the answer. So we're not gonna do that here. Let's see, what else do I like? Another book on stoicism. The Obstacle is the Way. Good book. Not a big book. It's nice to not have giant books, I think. Here's another one. The four-hour work week. This is how I get so much done. Everyone always asks me, how do you get so much done? You have all of these books up here that I've been involved with in some way. And I have the training site, and I have a podcast, and I do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the answer to that is... I'm efficient. You need to make sure that you are efficient. This book will teach you how to be efficient. This is not to say you should only work four hours each week. It's to say 
you can work, you can get 40 hours worth of work done in four hours, eh, maybe not 40, but call it 20. And then you use your other 36 hours each week to grind hard, right? That's how you get a lot done. I get a vibe I'm not getting YouTube chat. I don't know why I'm not getting YouTube chat and um, Periscope chat, I'm clearly not getting that either. Give me one second. I'm just going to experiment with something. This will not take me long. Why is that? Why is... Oh, no. It says my computer's uh, camera is on, but there's absolutely no, no reason that should be on. Give me just one minute. Is there a way for me to turn up my voice? No. We're not turning up my voice today. You know, I'll, I'll attempt to turn up my voice. Hmm. So here we have Periscope. I, I loaded up Periscope. Give me one second, Periscope. How do I share this on Twitter? It says we're live. There's a few people. How do I share this on Twitter? Let's see. I'll click share on Twitter. We'll give it a whirl. I don't know if that's going to do anything. Technology's hard. I appreciate all of you bearing with me. All right. Is there a way for me to turn up my volume? Let's actually try to do this. Let's pick up the coffee. Actually, it's tea today. I'm going to move the microphone closer to me. Okay? The setup, I, I posted a picture of the setup on Twitter and uh, Instagram. The setup is not, not the best. But, you know, we're trying to make it work for all of you. Okay. You say YouTube is lagging. All right, well, good. That's nice. Maybe this is just not going to work. Maybe we're only going to stream on um, Instagram. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. If we find that this does not work so well, we're going to pack it up and call it a day. But, hey, that's okay. You don't always get what you want. All right. Anyway, four-hour work week. I definitely recommend this book, especially if you have any desire to have a business, if you have a business, if you want to be able to not work at your job and do something else, do something you enjoy. Four Hour Work Week is a good book. Mm. I'm just throwing all my books on the floor. What else do we have? There's another book. It's called Angel. This book is about investing in small companies. Now, this is definitely not for everyone, but it has been made legal for the most part to invest in small companies, startup companies, even if you are not an accredited investor. So over the next few years, you're going to find you can you're going to be able to start putting in something like $50 or $100 into a company like Uber before it becomes Uber, of course. And next thing you know, maybe you have millions and millions of dollars. This is by Jason Calacanis. I like Jason Calacanis. I met him at a book launch party for Phil Helmuth's book. I helped get uh, Poker Brat, it's up there, published, and um, I got to go do that. You say it's backwards. Oh, that's true, because you're looking at a camera. You're right, it is backwards. Is it backwards on the other one? Hmm, weird. Anyway, Angel's a good book. I wonder if it'd be backwards if we're doing it the other way. It's an interesting question. Anyway, these are some of my favorite books. I like these books, I think they're all good. They've all been beneficial to me. And that's it. Let's see, what next? Transitioning from multi-table tournaments to cash. Woo, that's a big question. A lot of people think that because they are good tournament players, that they must also be good cash game players. And you always want to ask, what is it that I do that makes me a good cash game player or a good tournament player? Now, good tournament players very often are a little bit overly aggressive which is fine. Very often they are good at pushing around their opponents. Often they know not to fold hands like top pair when they're playing 20 or 30 big blinds deep, right? These are all traits that a lot of people who are blindly lucky and naturally good at tournaments, this is, these are things that they do, right? So you need to figure out what skills you are lacking that cash game players have. Very often, 
whenever you're playing in tournaments, you're rewarded for getting all of the chips, right? Whereas in cash games, you're not rewarded for getting all the chips. You're rewarded for grinding up a stack steadily or just really trying to stack the bad players and minimize your losses against good players. There's no reason to play lots and lots of hands in cash games because the blinds are very irrelevant because you're playing very deep stack, right? So if you're playing very deep stack, you have to understand you're playing a different strategy. In tournaments, there's a lot of value in just stealing the blinds or stealing a three bet, stealing with a three bet, right? But in um, cash games, that's not so much the case, especially if you're playing really, really deep stack. So most likely, people who have good success at tournaments but bad success or are just awful at cash games, they're playing way too aggressively. Usually they are stacking off with stuff like top pair or 100 big blinds or 250 big blinds, whatever. And that's going to cost them a lot of money in the long run, and it's um, you, you can't you can't make up for that. So let's see. I shared on Twitter just a second ago that I'm on here on Periscope. Let's see if anything pops up. Oh, it looks like it's working. Who knows? Oh, technology. It's it's tough because I want I have many audiences, right? I have people on Twitter, on Twitch, on Facebook, on YouTube, probably other places I don't even know about who I want to share this with, but it's hard because I don't have many, many, many devices. Maybe I just need to get four iPhones and call it a day. All right, next. How to think like a pro as opposed to thinking like a fish. You're going to find that fish definitely rely on luck, and they like to look for outside things that cause their failures. And if they succeed, they often just think, maybe I ran hot, but also I'm probably just good. Okay, so when you fail, it's somebody else's fault. And when you do great, it's because you are so good. I think a lot of really good players think the exact opposite. When they fail, it is their fault. And when they do good, it's because they got lucky. And I, I mean, I know I, I certainly think this way. And I think most people do. Maybe this is more stoicism just coming out in, in general mindset. But um, something I read a long time ago, and you know, things that have always been sort of beaten to my mind as I've talked to other good players, is it's your fault when you do when you do poorly. Even when you run badly, it's your fault. You signed up to play, it's okay, right? And as long as you understand and accept the levels of variance that you're gonna encounter, it's fine. A lot of bad players, though, whenever they do poorly, they get annoyed, they get angry. Good players don't get annoyed and they get angry. They may get annoyed for a split second, but then they're over it. And also, their annoyance does not actually translate over into their play, whereas bad players let their annoyances come out in their play, whereas good players just play well all the time. Mike says, am I seeing this on Periscope? I am seeing this on Periscope. So that's good. I'm glad that we're seeing that chat. That came through seven, six or seven minutes ago. Somehow I'm just seeing it now. Oh, I see. It's actually going from top to bottom. How in the world did that happen? Oh, this is working. Sorry. Okay. Chat said, or on, uh, on Twitter, they said, put in earbuds. That will definitely help. You will find that if you cannot hear from your computer speakers, often it just means your computer speakers are not very good. Put in headphones, and you'll be able to hear like magic. Do I have a meditation practice? I have tried in the past, and um, I've come to the conclusion that my brain's crazy. And I definitely tried to sit and silence my mind, but no, I do not have any sort of daily meditation practice. I try to go to the gym every day. That might be slightly meditative, but um, I think in today's society, a lot of people think that things are good for everyone, and th some things work for everyone. And um, I know for a fact that's just not true, right? Like some people, they love going to the gym and pumping iron, working out with the weights. Other people hate that, but they love doing sports, right? Both people are working out. Both people are doing it differently. And some people will swear by weights and some people will swear by sports. Things like meditation are similar. I mean, for me, almost like writing books is meditative because I get in the zone. I'm feeling great. We're doing it. It clears my mind of everything and it's wonderful. But that's not me sitting there doing nothing. So... No, I do not have a practice where I sit and do nothing. Although I do see how that can be very beneficial. 
and I have tried it in the past unsuccessfully many times. You can say, oh, you're practicing. It doesn't have to be successful. But um, <laughs> I, I don't really feel the desire to practice. The Chris Marie says, you watch my videos on note-taking at jlpoker.com slash notes. It's a must-watch if you're serious about live tournaments. I definitely agree, and it is. All right. People who don't understand the game are less like... Oh, people who understand the game are less likely to get annoyed. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. As you become better and better, you become more of a robot in terms of your mindset. Um, there's been some books published recently by a few people who say something to the effect of, why would you ever go on tilt? It's just bad. But they don't understand that people are not robots. It's very, very, very important to understand people are not robots, right? So, understanding you're not a robot is sort of the first step in moving towards being more robotical and not letting your emotions bother you or letting your emotions affect you. From there, you have to understand what tilts you, what, what gets under your skin, what makes you angry, what makes you annoyed. And I'm trying something right now. Let me know. Let me know if the volume gets better on on um, YouTube and Twitch. I don't think it will, but let me know if it did. Volume's all the way up to the max, everyone. Sorry. Yeah, volume is at a hundred percent. A hundred percent's a lot. Put in headphones. That will solve your problem. Um, so anyway, figure out what, what gets under your skin, right? I know some people get angry whenever just like the dealer messes up, right? If the dealer messes up and let's say they deal you an ace and then they flip up your second ace, a lot of people will go on raging tilt. You have to ask why, why does that tilt me? You think, oh, because I would have had something, right? A lot of things regarding to tilt are because you feel wronged. You feel as if someone has taken something from you and Understand you don't have anything to start with. Sometimes the dealer is going to mess up. What if the dealer riffled the cards one more time? Then they would, they would have taken away your aces, right? In theory, you could get aces every single hand, but you don't. So do you feel wronged because you don't get them every time? No, because you don't expect this, right? You need to lose your expectations. Get rid of your expectations because they're ridiculous. <laughs> a lot of people expect to have a better run of cards than normal. Remember, Tommy Angelo a while back wrote something to the effect of you can go to the casino, drive there for two hours, sit, maybe not even get in the game because none of the games look good, get back in your car and drive two hours and go home. And you successfully played poker that day because you didn't play in any bad games. You didn't punt any money, right? And that is an interesting thought process. A lot of people think that I must go play in a game and I must gamble and I must try to do well. But doing well sometimes means not gambling. Also, you can go and you can get in a game that looks great, and then you get 7-2 offsuit every hand, or comparable hands, for the next five hours, the game breaks, and you go home. You, again, successfully played poker that day. But you're going to blind out, you're going to lose money, maybe even try to get a 3-bet bluff in every once in a while, and it fails, and that's okay, right? You have these expectations in your mind of going to the casino and winning money, Right? And that's just not going to happen a lot of the time. So get your expectations out of your head. Um, Raph says correctly that playing out of your bankroll will cause you to tilt. That's definitely true. Definitely accurate. And don't play out of your bankroll, right? That's, that's poker 101. I wrote something a while back that one easy way to tilt less is to make sure you are properly bankrolled. And someone took offense to this, saying that your bankroll shouldn't matter because if you're profitable, you're profitable. Therefore, that should not tilt you. You have to understand you will go broke more often, but it should not tilt you. And I think that's um, just completely asinine. <laughs> you, you definitely want to be completely mentally sound with your decision making. If you think that your life is at risk and your future earning potential is severely at risk if things go poorly in this one hand, or this one session. If that one hand or session goes poorly, you're going to lose your mind. Also, you know, sometimes you just play tighter whenever you think you're playing for all your money. 
Hey, Goff wants me to wants to be live in my video on Instagram. We're not doing live video on Instagram at the moment. We are trying to stream on all of the platforms. So no, we're not doing live. Hello to everyone on all the platforms, by the way. I believe they're all working today except for Facebook. Sorry, Facebook. You're left out. All right. Liud says on YouTube, you're at university. How many hours of poker do you think you should study? You're not looking to ever become a pro because your mindset is unsuited for it. I think everyone's mindset can become suited for poker. You just have to learn. You have to become educated and you have to understand what is likely in the game, right? Um, I posted something on a site the other day. Someone said that their mindset was not suited to poker and I said, because they get angry when they lose. And I would ask, why do you get angry when you lose? Right? What's it matter? It doesn't really matter. Understand that money is just a story that we tell ourselves to keep score of everything in life. And you don't have to have money to be successful, right? That's not required. Money is useful because it is a resource, but it's not like the, it's not the defining factor of your life and it should not be, I don't think. Um, but anyway, the question is, how much should you study as much as you realistically can and want to? But if you're not going to try to actually devote significant time to poker to become good, I would suggest you find something else to do with your time. Poker is a fun hobby if you actually plan to use it throughout your life. And it is probably worth the investment of time. But if you're just going to play with your friends, what you do? Where is it? Uh, you get one of these two books, Strategies for Beating Small Six Poker Tournaments or Strategies for Beating Small Six Poker Cash Games. You read them and that's it. Call it a day. You're not trying to become a genius. You're not trying to be the, the best poker player ever. So understand that, right? It's not a priority. So since it's not a priority, don't devote your life to it. How do you handle, handle players who are better than you? Play as close to game theory optimal as you can. Or find holes in their game and exploit them. That's how you handle everyone. All right. If you put pressure to play on your life, like your life depended on, it can have some negative effects. Yeah, you don't need pressure. You just want to go there and play as realistically well as you can. Dave says, hello. Welcome. It's Darren. I'm live on Twitter. Good. I'm glad to hear that I'm live on Twitter. If you have a losing session, session don't chase your losses. Yeah. I mean, understand. Again, losses, right? Losses. People think that loss is a bad thing, and it's not. You're going to lose sometimes when you play poker. I hate to break it to you. And you're going to lose often, especially if you're bad, all right? And most people who get annoyed are also bad. So they're going to have more losing sessions than the average player. And that makes them lose their mind and go off the deep end. All right. When you play live, you like to talk to people on the other side of you. Sure, be friendly, and they will show you their cards, which is great. How do you deal with people who talk too much? Um, you can put headphones in. You can put big headphones on. If you put big headphones on, people will often just not talk to you. You can wear sunglasses. You can look at them and tell, say, leave me alone, et cetera, et cetera. If you're a multi-table tournament player, you're going to have a losing session 90% of the time. Yeah, that's right. You absolutely will. Maybe 85% of the time. Maybe 80% of the time. Whatever it is. And I think tournament players are often better at losing than cash game players. Because when you buy into a tournament, I think everyone sort of gets a fresh mindset unless they're re-entering in which case maybe they can still go off the deep end but often it is an event right you're going to the turn the casino to play an event and you don't want to just give your event away that's silly and re-entry tournaments sometimes people do go off the deep end but normally i don't think they do nearly as much they may tilt off their stack but if you tilt off one stack in a tournament and you're properly bankrolled you lose one one hundredth or one three hundredth of your buy-in or out of your bankroll, and it's like not that detrimental. Whereas in cash games, often people play with 20 or 30 buy-ins because they think they have some gigantic edge, which often they don't. And if they do go off the deep end, they, it's easier to go off the deep end because they can sit there and they can just tilt off their stack over and over and over again. They can punt 100 big blinds, punt 100 big blinds, punt 100 big blinds, and keep punting. And next thing you know, they're broke. So it's definitely easier to tilt off your stack at cash games than it is at tournaments. <coughs> Let's see. <clears throat> what did I do to train a long time ago, and how did I study? I use this program called Sit and Go Power Tools to get good at sit and goes. It's um, now defunct. ICMizer is way better. ICMizer is like a good sit and go power tools. You can find me playing videos of it. I think at jlpoker.com/icm, maybe slash ICMizer, one of the two. So that's really good for sit and goes and final table scenarios. 
And that's how I got really good at sit and goes a long time ago. And from there, I used a lot of trial and error. I beat my head against the wall over and over and over again. And I observed what a lot of the best players were doing. I definitely think it's very valuable, valuable to watch other good players play to learn what they are doing. Someone mentioned that it's, it's easy to not care about money when you already have money. They think I live in a New York City penthouse. That's clearly uh, an inaccurate thought process. But hey, that's what some people think. Um, anyway, it's important to not want things. And in reality, I don't think I want much of anything. Because, like, what, what do I really want? What do I need in life? I want to have good health. I want to have a good family. That's all I really want. I definitely do not need things. And again, you may say, look, you have all these trophies up here. You have all these books. You've done stuff. And, you know, maybe that is true. But I think once you do get a hold of some things, you realize you don't need any of those things. I'm actively trying to get rid of all of my useless physical stuff. I want to have a small footprint. I want to be able to get up and go whenever I want. I value um, versatility. And I also value speed. And having lots of stuff holds you down. Um, so anyway, I would definitely suggest you try to not want a whole lot. There's there's some there's something somewhere in the Stoicism book. I forget where it is. Anyway, there's something in that Stoicism book. No, it's down here somewhere. The Daily Stoic. There's something in this book that says something to the effect of being rich involves having few wants. And I definitely think that's very true. When you see someone with something, don't think that you need to have that thing. Because things are pretty useless. Tools are very useful, but things are not so useful. Did I write all these books? I wrote all these books on the top shelf, besides um, two of them. I did help those get published, though. Um, Phil Helmuth's biography and Mike Sexton's biography, I helped get those published. So they're up on the top shelf as well. All right. You need money to attract a girl and have a family. You need to be a good person who benefits society to attract the right kind of girls. <laughs> and to have a family, you know, money is definitely useful to have a family. I completely agree with that. And you need to figure out a way to get those resources. Also, you can live cheaply. I think you don't want to live poorly. But you can live cheaply. Oh, my baby's crying out there. Uh, so you need to figure out ways to get by that. Sorry, my baby's crying. He's distracting me. You need to figure out ways to, to make the most of what you have and to also not desire stuff. I mean, for example, with my baby out there who's crying right now, we can take him to the park. It's completely free to go to the park. And he has a great time. It costs nothing, right? Or we could... um. Maybe you, maybe you're gonna go get him. Hey, Steffi. Okay, okay. Steffi, can you bring me James? James, come here. Come here. We're gonna get the baby in here. Hey, come here. What's wrong? Come here. What's wrong? You wanna be on the camera? Come here. Ugh. Ugh. Say hello. Say hello to everyone. Why are you crying? Why are you crying? You just wanna have a good, happy, healthy family. But yeah, um, lots of money attracts gold diggers, as someone says. That said, it is very important to attract high-quality people. You want to make sure you are hanging out with people who are better than you. Oh, James, look, you're not, you're not in the picture. Stand up. Stand up. There you go. There you go. Say hi. Say hello. You say hi? Yeah. All right. Can you go be a good, good, good boy? You feeling better? Yeah, you'll be a good boy? Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. I love you. Go with Steffi. Bye-bye. All right, come get the toothbrush Nope, that's, that's my computer. All right, go get the toothbrush. Can you shut the door, please? Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, there's Mr. James. Um, anyway, a lot of people go to bars to try to attract people. I think that's a horrible place to meet people because whenever you go to a bar to, a get, to try to meet people, all you know is that they like to drink. Presumably. That's the first thing you, you know. And you also know that they do not have a close circle of friends. Presumably. A few, few, few presumptions, but often they're accurate. 
you need to find good quality people. And I do not necessarily think that money is that beneficial. Of course, you need some amount of money, but you don't need infinite. All right, let's see. Other questions. Everyone says, hello to, hello to Mr. James. Hello to Mr. James. Where did I meet my wife? I met my wife at the PCA in the Bahamas. She was there on the last day of a New Year's Eve trip. Um, I actually had a fiance before my wife, and she did not have a lot going on and had no aspirations. Or she lost her aspirations, one of the two. And I knew after that that I wanted to make sure I had a girlfriend or wife who had things going on in life who also could sustain herself because I don't want her relying on me for things. I mean, it's fine for people to rely on you, but I don't, again, I'm not trying to get a gold digger is what it amounts to. And um, that's how I met my wife. I met her at the PCA. She was, it was her last day of a New Year's Eve trip and my first day. I was actually there. Poker stars would always lose my money every time I wired it to them. This was eight or nine years ago. So I knew to show up a day ahead of time. So I show up a day ahead of time, and I'm playing a $100 sit-and-go because poker stars lost my money. They said, come back in a few hours. It's no Atlantis. The walk back to your room is like a mile. So I just stayed there, and I played a $100 sit-and-go with um, Jonathan Jaffe, a player who I beat to win one of these trophies up here. Beat him heads up. Um, it was him, three of his friends, so four guys, and their four girlfriends, and me. So when this girl stood behind me, I knew she wasn't with any of the guys, which literally never happens. So I turned around and said, what are you doing here? Because that's, what else would you ask someone who's standing there? And she said, oh, nothing, sorry, I'll leave. I'm like, oh, no, it's okay, you can stay. Then I asked, um, why was she not married? And she said she didn't know. And um, then I gave away the poker tournament, and we went out, and we had a quesadilla and a glass of white wine. I ate and drank all of it, because she had already eaten. Then she left. She went back home to New York City. We kept in touch on the through the internet, and then... Um, a few weeks later, one of my students, Steve Beglider, who final tabled the main event, he was having a charity tournament in New York City. So he asked if I would come out here to play his charity tournament. And normally I would not go just to play a charity tournament, but I said, sure, I'll hang out with my wife, Amy, my now wife, Amy, and play the charity tournament. So I did that. I was staying in a hotel that was way too expensive. And then Amy said, why don't you come stay with me? So I said, sure. I moved in. And that's that. All right. Everyone's saying the volume is too low. We're going to have to figure out how to fix the volume here. For all those who don't understand, I have a gigantic microphone right in front of me. And I'm pretty much yelling right at it. We'll try to figure it out, though. We'll fix it next time. Sorry about that. So, but yes, um, my wife is a lawyer. She always had a good job. She was a young lawyer when I met her. Now she's a, a counsel at a New York City law firm. And... I knew I wanted someone who had something going on, right? I, I knew I was not going to be dating someone who wanted to sit on the couch all day and watch TV. Simple as that. So that was something I was looking for. You learn as you date people things you look for in your spouse slash mate, right? You find things you like, you find things you don't like, then you find someone who has mostly likes and very few dislikes, and maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't. We also took a really long time getting married. Um, we, we dated for, I think, seven, six or six and a half or seven years before we got married. And I think that's important too. I think a lot of people get married way too fast and inevitably they break up and they ask, oh my God, I can't believe I broke up. This is so devastating. But yeah, you dated for like three months before you hopped in there. You know, be smart about it. All right. Your answer is definitely hard to meet people like you said. It is hard to meet people like that. But if you're just... So listen, interestingly enough, the only reason she came to my table as opposed to everyone else's table is because we were having fun. We were playing a $100 game for fun, right? And we were, it was a casual game. We were enjoying ourselves. It looked like we were having a good time, and we were. Nobody else in the room looked like they were having a good time. She actually went to like four other tables before she stopped behind mine. Then she came up and she talked to me. I had to seize the opportunity. Or she came up behind me and I had to talk to her, right? I seized the opportunity and then I followed up on it, right? A lot of people, they just would have said, okay, I had a good time. It was fun. See you in the next life. And 
if you show that you are a responsible human and a fun human, you'll probably attract pretty good people. No one wants, for lack of better words, a boring loser, right? Nobody wants a boring loser. So you need to make sure that you look like you'd be fun. Let's see. Any thoughts on Short Deck? No, I've not played Short Deck Hold'em at all, and I don't plan to anytime in the near future. A lot of games have come and gone. It's very important to understand. Um, some stick and some don't. The high variance games often do not stick so well. The super high variance games often do not stick so well because no one wins. Um, so, you know, like poker, uh, PLO is a good example of this, right? It's a game that people thought was going to take over the world because the amateurs loved it. But then they realized the pros don't really have a great win rate unless the opponents are awful. But people don't stay awful for too long, so win rates go into the dumpster. Also, the game's really slow. Short deck's not slow, which is nice. It's a much faster game. But uh, PLO is a really slow game, and that's why it has not really taken off. And that is why it will eventually dry up, right? Are you working on any new books? I am currently editing a book by Michael Acevedo. Very, very good online player. Probably the foremost expert in GTO play. And I don't know when that's going to be out. We're waiting on him to finish writing it. I've edited everything he's turned in so far. It's a really good book. I'm excited about that one. I've learned a lot from it already. Then I am working on Excelling at Online No Limit Hold'em. That's going to be out in maybe a year or two. Essentially, it is a... I'm getting all of the, author, or the coaches from the POCAR backing site to write chapters. We're going to have a lot of chapters on individual topics, kind of like the first Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. It's going to be another big book, probably 500 pages or so. And I'm looking forward to that. A quick explanation on GTO. Basically, you play in a manner that makes it to where your opponents either lose or break even. That's it. Exploitative play is the opposite, where you are trying to maximally exploit what your opponents do wrong. And people try to say, oh, GTO is better, or exploitative is better, but they're comparable. They go together. Well, I don't know if they're comparable. They're compatible. They go together. You want to play well. Playing well often means playing GTO against the best players in the world. Playing exploitative is often best against bad players. So when you're playing, you don't say, I'm only going to play GTO or I'm only going to play exploitative. That's dumb. That means you're playing poorly. You need to play in whatever way maximizes your expectation. Are you going to work on a PLO book? No, I'm not a professional PLO player. I have played PLO online for six months straight. I had a reasonably nice win rate, and that was it. I've gone through stretches in the past where I play one game a lot for about six months to try to get good at it, just in case I ever find myself in a situation where that game pops up. Like in the World Series of Poker, I'm happy to jump in Potlum at Omaha tournaments, right? Um, I think a final table of WCOOP tournament, actually, in PLO. I think I took fifth or sixth place in some WCOOP tournament a long time ago. Anyway, that, this was back when I was playing it a lot. But no, I am not a very good professional PLO player, so I'm not going to write a book on it. I only write about things I know. We discussed this right at the top of the, the stream today. You don't need to talk and write things just because you can. You need to make sure you're actually an expert in it and you're adding value. Thoughts on six-card PLO? I've never played it. I have played five-card PLO, and it seems pretty easy just to play tight, make good, car with good hands, and get your money in. Any transition on transitioning from cash to tournaments? Usually cash game players are way too tight, way too loose, way too splashy. And um, in tournaments, you have to be a little bit more tight aggressive. Um, you have to be more aggressive, especially, because picking up pots is very, very beneficial. But I would tell you to read my first book, Strategies for Beating Small Six Poker Tournaments. That would be very, very beneficial for you. Someone said a minute ago that women ruined up your life, or women screwed up your life. And understand, you pick the people who are around you, besides your parents. You pick everyone. If you don't like the people at your job, get a new job. If you don't like your friends, get new friends. Obviously, some people can be malicious, and that's unfortunate when that happens. But most of the problems in your life you have caused yourself. If you're watching all this on, an, on a phone right now, right? I understand people in third world countries who started off just like completely dirt poor with absolutely nothing. They're in a bad spot, and it's going to be rough for them. But if you were born in America or a, uh, a country where you have a decent amount of opportunity and wealth, all of your problems you cause on yourself for the most part. And you need to figure out ways to solve those problems. 
Do I have a good Phil Locke story? Not really. I played with him a few times. He's always a character, but I don't think I have any great stories. How do I control myself about winning too much in a cash game? I mean, I don't know. It's fine to win too much in a cash game. The only time you don't want to win the maximum is if you fear you will not get invited back. That's pretty much it. There are maybe, like, I mean, really, none of these instances ever occur to me because I don't play the same cash game on a very regular basis. But if you play in the same cash game on a very regular basis and they can ban you, then you want to make sure you're not winning all the money. But that is that situation essentially never comes up. Do I play dealer's choice tournaments? No. Again, I try to do things that provide value, either monetarily for myself, value for all of you out there, etc. And dealer's choice tournaments are often relatively small stakes, and you have to make sure you know a lot of games well. And I don't know a lot of games well. The only games I know well, No Limit Hold'em, Limit Hold'em, Pot Limit Omaha, Limit Omaha 8 or better. That's it. Four games. I'm competent enough at Deuce to 7 Triple Draw. And that's it. I have little experience with almost everything else. So if I only know four games out of 10, let's say, why would I play that tournament? That just seems dumb, right? I'm just giving away money by playing that. And if I'm even break even in the tournament, like let's say I'm playing a World Series event and I think I'm break even or even plus 20% ROI, I'm giving away a lot of time. PLO8, I've literally never played it. I think a lot of people like playing. This is a big difference between a lot of pros and a lot of recreational players is recreational players like to play. They're playing for fun, right? Whereas professionals play to make money. And professionals understand that they're going to have to devote 50 hours of their life to get competent at some game that they almost never get to play. So if I'm going to devote 50 hours of my time to a game that I'm literally going to play once or twice a year, is that worth it? And it's going to be for small stakes anyway. The answer is absolutely not. So understand you only have so much time in life and you need to make sure you're using it wisely. Did I play Borgata this week? I did not because I wanted to use my time wisely. I've thought about this a lot, whether or not I should be going to $3,500 buy-in tournaments when that's the only event. And I think the answer for me is just no, it's not worth the time. You may say, why? You, may, you can win a million bucks. You have to look at your return on investment, right? Let's say we're going to play at $3,500. let us say we play it twice on average and we have 50% ROI. So we're going to make $3,500 on the week. Fine. Uh, to go to Borgata, I usually take a car service. I'm typically not riding the bus. The bus is very cheap, but the bus is very shady. So I typically take a car service, which is 300 bucks each way. So that's $600 in expenses. Hotel room, let's call it 150 bucks a day for five days. That's 750 bucks. So now we're looking at $1,350 in expenses minus expensive food at Borgata. So we're making 3,500. We're spending, let's call it 1,500. So we're gonna make $2,000 on average in the week. It's not bad. Well, in the five days, four or five days. Let's call it five days. So we're making uh, $2,000 in five days. It's 500 bucks a day. Definitely a good win rate. However, I think I can usually do better when I go to play a tournament series like in Florida where they have a 5K and a 10K and a 25K and a bunch of side events and it costs the same amount to get there. It might even be cheaper. Um, so in that scenario, it makes a lot more sense to go invest $50,000 in a week as opposed to $7,000. If you make 50,000 investment in a week, you make 25K, let's call it 50% ROI, which is not accurate, it's gonna be lower. Let's call it 30% ROI. So you'll make 15,000 in a week minus the same 1,500 expenses. So now we're making 13,500 in a week as opposed to, what I say, 2,000, right? And that's how I look at it. I also understand I have a family and I don't wanna be traveling and playing all the time. So I'm not gonna do that. If someone reads the book, these small stakes books, would that plant wrong seeds in their brains? No, these small stakes books, two small stakes books, these books explain how to exploit bad players. You're going to find that in poker, you win because you're playing against bad players. If you're playing against all good players, you're not, um, you're not making money, right? So you always want to make sure you're playing against weaker players. Now, these books definitely don't teach you game theory optimal strategies. They teach you how to exploit mistakes. We have other books for that. Those are up there. Um, so no, I don't think it will hinder you. If anything, it will help you and help you learn just the basics of beating bad players. 
we says that my audible books are on point if you have not signed up for my audible books or gotten any of my audible books where i narrate them you can get two of them completely for free if you've never signed up for audible at jlpoker.com slash free how much do i watch final tables not really only when they are very very high stakes final tables often i get with players who i am um going to play against like poker masters is great for me because it's all very good players who i play against Whereas like a random WPT final table is kind of a waste of my time because I don't play with a lot of those random people. And they're often somewhat shallow stacked. Athenian, welcome. He says that if he adjusts the Twitch volume, say down and then back up, it returns to an acceptable level. So there's volume on Twitch. Maybe your Twitch volume is low to everyone who's saying they're having issues. <coughs> Sorry about that. Do I go? Am I planning to go to Fargo? If I didn't go to Borgata, I'm sure I'm not going to Fargo. In order for me to travel to a tournament series, I need at least something like a 3,500 or 5K main event and good side events. Have you ever met recreational players who are better than pros? Depending on what pros you mean. A pro, in theory, is someone who makes their living from doing something. Okay. A lot of people make $20,000 a year playing poker, and that's their only job. Are there recreational players who are better than them? Absolutely. Are there recreational players who are better than the top pros in the world? Absolutely not. So, depends on what you call a pro. Have I ever been berated at the table? I just kind of laugh at people. Um, whenever you laugh at someone who's berating you, you they usually get really um, annoyed, and I think that's a lot of fun. What's your opinion on getting staked? You only want to get staked if you are adequately skilled to play a game that you cannot realistically grind up a bankroll to get. So when is that? The only time I think it makes sense to get staked is when you're playing very high. Like really high. Because if you look at the way poker is outlined for the most part, the, the stakes essentially double all the way up. If you double your bankroll at 1-2, you're ready for 2-5. If you double at 2-5, you're ready for 5-10. If you double at 5-10, you're ready for 10-20. But if you double at 10-20, often the next stake is like 100-200. So you have to 10x your bankroll or more because your edge is going to be lower. When you see that exponential jump, that is the time it makes sense to get backed. This happens in tournaments too where it goes like, you know, 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000, 3,500, 10,000, 100,000, right? That's when you typically need to get back. Um, if you have no money, it means you're screwed up. Often, the best backies, by the way, are people who are awful at life, but are really good at poker. But you don't want to be awful at life. You don't want to be known to being awful for being awful at life. Ben says, I skipped 1025 and 2550. Often, those games don't run. Go to any casino in Vegas and find me a 510, a 1025, a 2550, a 50, 100, a 100, 200, and 200, 400. This doesn't exist. Um, it's tough to go our bankroll because you're playing in school. So there are some backing sites online. I'm a part owner of the Pokar Backing Company. I think they are great. I've learned a ton from them. And they will give people who have no money, money, and they will teach you two important things. If you don't have money and you're kind of good but not great, I think it makes a lot of sense to go to a backing company to get backed because they are going to teach you to win. Now then it's almost like you're exchanging part of your winnings for coaching, and that makes a lot of sense. But just purely having someone give you money so you can play bigger doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially if you have access to games at your regular level. Like think about it. Like let's say you're bankrolled for 2-5, but you could get staked for 5-10. You're essentially just playing double the stakes, but for half the money. Right? That's silly. What's that site code called? P-O-C-A-R-R.com. Very, very, very good staking company. What's the biggest cash games I've ever played? Um, I know 200, 400 multiple times. I don't think I've played bigger than 200, 400. Yeah, 200, 400 live and online. PLO online, fun enough. Back in the day... Um, you could short stack PLO. So you could buy into 
uh, 200, 400 PLO for $8,000, 20 big blinds, but everybody else was buying in for 100. And whenever you're the shortest stack at the table, you often have a significant edge, especially in games where your opponent should play different ranges based on stack size, like PLO. So you sit there, you play aces, you get it all in, you double up and you leave. People say, oh my God, you are a rat holer. No, I was making money. And um, the biggest winners in those games were often the people who did this exactly that. Will you write a PLO book? Absolutely not. I'm not a professional PLO player. I do not write about things I do not know. How can a company trust random people with their money? They have lots of ways to go about doing this. Um, a few people they have had to shame publicly. They will post websites of you if you do scam them, and they will out you, and you will never get any sort of deal in the poker world again. Often, now what they do is they make people put money down up front. You may say, that's crazy. These people don't have money. Often, it's just the money, amount of money that's significant for them. So say you want to get staked to play $10 turns. You're going to need 1000 bucks, let's say. They'll make you give them $300 in cash. You just have to give it to them before you even get anything. That shows that you are serious, and it shows that you're committed. And you get your 300 bucks back, of course, whenever, whenever the deal is done. But that's, uh, that's a way to minimize risk for the company because then if you do happen to rob them, well, at least they got 300 bucks, right? And it's not like they give you all 100 right off the bat. They give you like 100 a day or something like this. Let's see. Lee says, you have a humongous ROI playing small tournaments. Would you still recommend that site to try to get staked for Run It Up Reno? Um, Pokard does not back people for random one-off tournaments. Often they do not back Americans either for various reasons. Also, 171 tournaments is not a ton. It is some, but it's it's not a ton. But anyway, get in there and do it. Do you need to be staking for, stake for Run It Up Reno? Now, I don't know anything about any of these live tournament series, but make sure you're not paying a lot of rake. In a lot of random tournaments, ra random places, they charge a lot of rake, and that is not a good thing. So make sure you're not playing a ton, paying a ton of rake. Looks like Facebook never got up and running today. That's unfortunate. But I think everything else worked. Ben says, you don't play deuce to seven, no limit? No, I don't spend my time playing random games. We discussed this already. Spend your time wisely. How often do I have the opportunity to play two, or deuce to seven, no limit? It's like literally never. Once during the World Series, right? If you look at a lot of these games, by the way, the World Series, you will find that the people who make it to the top of those games make it to the top consistently. So what does that say? It shows there's a very large skill edge in those games and often the players who have been playing those games for a long time are the ones with a large skill edge so me as someone who can only devote 50 or 100 hours to this is it worth it for me to try to extract 20 or 30 percent return on investment from a tournament and the answer is absolutely not wow time remaining two minutes it says on instagram we got to wrap it up apparently you can only live stream for an hour who'd have thought that's good for me because it caps me thank you for everyone for all your questions today is today Friday? I think it's Friday. So we're not going to have a little poker advice, or we're not going to have a, um, a little coffee tomorrow. I didn't have any coffee today. I had literally no coffee. Today we have uh, poor tea with a little bit of um, oolong tea in it. The next little, uh, next, a little coffee will be on Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. We're going to do this Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern time, every day. I'm going to try to get this up on Facebook. I'm going to try to get my setup a little bit better. I'm going to try to figure out why the volume was not working well. It's weird because whenever I talk into my um, microphone normally, I have like no problem with the volume. But for some reason, the volume has not been great today on this camera here. All right. Thanks again for being here. Yeah, P-O-C-A-R-R.com. Someone with a Z name says, answer your question. What happens when the dealer is showing a six? Do you hit or do you stay? You stay, clearly. Blackjack's an easy game. There's a little card you can get that answers, that gives you all of the answers for blackjack. There's also a little card you can get that tells you when to adjust when you are um, doing math in your head. All right, have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice to each other.